Well, happy Sabbath. What a delight. I don't know about you, but what a delight to be in the house of worship, God's home, every Sabbath. And in this home, what a privilege for us to be blessed by God, and not only be blessed by God, but in fact, be blessed by each other's company, each other's love. And so I am so delighted to be able to be here with you. I know that the majority of our church members and our brothers are right now at Baby Beach enjoying the Sabbath. And it's going to be a blessed Sabbath at Baby Beach because not only will the Lord bless, but through baptism we can see the influence of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of His people. And so that's a great blessing. So I'm delighted that um, um, uh, even though we, are, we obviously are not going to be able to be there with our brothers and sisters, but that you've chosen to be here. And of course, I am delighted that uh, uh, we will be able to worship the Lord here. I want to thank the ministry of music. The ministry of music brings us to the throne of grace. It opens the heart for us to be able to emotionally receive God in the heart and in the mind. And so I just want to thank you as you sing and praise the Lord. Thank you for that. Today, um, I want to concentrate on, by the way, uh, the last Sabbath we, we, we preached on the, uh, the writings of the Apostle Peter. And this Sabbath, I'm going to concentrate on the writings of the Apostle Peter. And I'm going to tell you why. The first and the second epistle of Peter is written to the church. He is written to the church then in the first century, and it is written for the church here today. And there is a similarity of problems, a similarity of challenges, a similarity of opportunities. And so I really cannot but love the first and the second epistle of Peter. And today we're going to concentrate a little bit on chapter 1 of Peter. Chapter 1 of Peter. And yes, if you have, uh, if you see it on the screen, the title of our sermon is The Self-Controlled Life. The Self-Controlled Life. And the self-controlled life, Peter describes, is a life we need to live when we accept Jesus Christ and we walk the walk, the pathway, the journey that Jesus and God has set for you and for me. A self-controlled life. But before I do that, I just want to do, and I have been praying every day and this morning intensely that this may not be about Victor, but this may be about God. So let's pray. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I stand before you as a sinner. Lord, a sinner willing to be used by you this morning. I ask, O oh Lord, that you cleanse my sins, that you purify my heart, and that, Lord, you embed yourself in my heart, and that the Holy Spirit might, may occupy the very inner being. Father, I want to hear your word. Lord, I want, to, I want to hear your admonition. May this sermon, Lord, be your word preached. Father, take my will and mold it into yours. Lord, right now, just now, help me to die for self. For, Father, the only glorification that I seek is yours. Lord, may your character be glorified. May your light be shown. May your love be real. Thank you, Father, for your amazing grace. For we ask it in Jesus' name.
for many years, Paul Harvey. Ooh, how many of you remember the famous broadcaster Paul Harvey? Ooh, there's, oh, I can see. I know this is like, like an, an older type generation, Paul Harvey. Paul Harvey was pretty famous. Paul Harvey was pretty famous. For many years, Paul Harvey never varied from his routine. It's an interesting story. The alarm clock would ring every day at 3.30 in the morning. And by the way, he lived at the time in a 22-room home in River Forest, Illinois. 22-bedroom home. That alarm rang every morning at 3.30. He would get up. He would brush his teeth, he would shave, he would shower, and of course he would get dressed. He loved oatmeal, so his breakfast was oatmeal. He got into his car and he drove downtown Chicago every day. It took about 45 minutes for that routine on a daily basis. He dressed in a shirt, he had a coat, he put a necktie on as if going to work as the president of the largest bank in Chicago. Unlike, unlike or in sharp contrast to the informal manner com common to most radio broadcasters, it was really different. He was individually different. It is all about discipline, says Paul, Paul Harvey. It's all about discipline. I could go to work, he said, in my pajamas. But long ago, some advice from the man who was the engineer of his, own, of his friend, Billy Graham, he said, Paul, and this was the, the advice, Paul, if you don't use self-control in every area of your life, your mental faculty, your emotional faculty, and your physical faculty, self-control, you will lose your edge. If you don't exercise self-control, Paul, you will lose your edge. It's no surprise that the Bible urges us to develop this important virtue, self-control, living a self-controlled life. Three times in Peter's first letter, the apostle gives the command to be self-control. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13, he tells us, prepare your minds for action, be self-controlled. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 7, he tells us, the end of all things is near. Isn't that familiar to the times you and I live? The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. And then in chapter 5, verses 8, it tells us, be self-controlled and alert. You see, when you and I live a self-controlled life, we wrap immeasurable benefits we really reap significant benefits. In his first letter written to the Christian church, Peter is giving us a tip on a better way to do life. He is inviting you and me to participate in the abundant life in Christ Jesus. Reading from the New King James Version, 1 Peter 1.13, 1 Peter 1.13, Peter tells us, this is the New King James Version, Therefore, 
Listen to this carefully. Therefore, gird your loins of your mind. Oh, I love this expression. Gird the loins of your mind. Then he says, be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, what does that mean? Okay, let's, let's read it from the New International Version. The New International Version translates that, that Greek as follows. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. So what is the Apostle Peter telling us in this particular verse? In verse 13 of chapter 1 of the first letter of Peter. You see, when he starts the verse with, with therefore, he's making reference to what the Apostle Peter has already written in the previous 12 verses. So in verses 13, 1 to 12 of chapter 1, Peter is describing the blessings and hope contained in the splendor of the beauty of the gospel, which is the, the, the gift of salvation. And seeing that we have the certainty of salvation, and we know that the gospel is for us, therefore, Gird up the loins, prepare our minds for action. For now we have a reason to desire to live. See, based on the beauty of the gospel and the gift of salvation, Peter tells the believer not only to prepare the mind for action, but to be ready to follow suit with action, to prepare our minds for diligent activity. This requires that we control and that we guard our thoughts to ensure that we think right thoughts and perform right actions. This also requires that we control and that we guard our affections. You see, the Christian, the believer, you and I, needs to stop speculating on unprofitable topics and unprofitable chatter and should exercise his or her mind on the great truths of salvation revealed by the Spirit of Christ. Peter's concern was just that, that we, re to, we need to prioritize our destiny. We need to prioritize our thought process of where we are going. We need to really begin to live today as if we were in the kingdom of God with God. Be sober. That's how the New King, uh, the New King James tells it. Be self-control. How the New International Version tells it. The Greek word for both words is nepo, N-E-P-H-O, nepo, which when translated literally means to abstain from intoxicated drink. That's why the new, the new King James says, be sober. Abstain from being intoxicated. Okay? So this world, or this particular word is used, consistently in the New Testament to refer to the spiritual sobriety and balance of one's life, of a Christian's life. You and I are told to be sober, to, be, to have a self-controlled life. Peter warns believers not to conform to habits of sin, but instead to show restraint. He tells us in 1 Peter 1, 14, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14, as obedient children, do not conform to evil desires. 
desires that you have gathered while living in ignorance. The Apostle Peter continues by giving three simple principles that represent the best way to live. And I'm going to concentrate on those this morning. Three basic principles, guidelines that mark the self-controlled life. The first of these principles is to live with nothing to hide. Live with nothing to hide. Peter calls us to live with nothing to hide. In verses 15 and 16 of chapter 1, Peter tells us, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am am holy. Peter is quoting from Leviticus chapter 19 verses 2 where the Lord not only proclaims that he God is holy but also calls the children of Israel to be holy as he is holy. Let's look at Leviticus 19 2. You see in Leviticus 19 2 we read speak to all the congregation. God is telling Moses speak to Israel and to the congregation of Israel. Speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. That's a message for you and for me today. We are God's Israelites of today's time. Be holy as I am holy. You see, our God who calls you and I to enter into a relationship with Him is absolutely holy. How God's holy. That means that no sin or defilement, defilement can exist in His presence. And sometimes, sometimes we don't quite assimilate how important it is for us to understand just that. He is holy. And as we come in His presence, We've got to be holy. And yes, the rope of righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ provides us that opportunity. So, if we desire to walk in harmony with God, and God is absolutely holy, no sin or defilement can exist in His presence. So, if that is why the Apostle Peter is urging us in 1 Peter 1.15, to be holy in all our conduct. It's part of really ensuring that we walk a self-controlled life. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26, 26 and 27 tells us that we were made in the image of God. Unfortunately, through sin, we lost God's likeness. Well, the purpose of the gospel is to restore the divine image in human beings, that we may be holiest as the Creator is holy. No wonder Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Ellen G. White, writing about Peter's urging message to the Christian church, tells us as follows. Ellen G. White, manuscript uh, 125, written in 1907. Ellen G. White says, As Jehovah is holy, he requires his people to be holy, pure, and defiled, for without holiness no man shall see the Lord. She says, Those who worship him in sincerity and truth will be accepted by him. She goes on. There's a couple more slides. She goes on. She goes on. If Church members will put away. Can you read that? 
all self-worship and will receive in their hearts the love for God and for one another that filled Christ's, Christ's art, our Heavenly Father will constantly manifest His power through them. Let His people be drawn together with the cords of divine love. And then she says, then the world will recognize the miracle working power of God and will acknowledge that He is the strength and the helper of his commandment-keeping people. What a message. What a message. Holiness means to be set apart for God from the world. Holiness means that you and I make a decision through the redemption of our Lord at the cross. To say goodbye to the world and be a follower of Jesus Christ. Holiness means to voluntarily say to the Lord, I'm yours. Hold my hand, lead me into the pathway which you want me to go. For I am no longer part of this world but a pilgrim bound for heaven with you. I know. I know that this is not easy. I know that reality is tough. See, the, the highway to holiness is very narrow as it winds through our culture, a culture full of sensuality and materialism and immorality. That journey is not easy, and I know that. Yet Christians, believers like you and I, are called to walk that straight and narrow road, and walk that requires us to avoid anything that hints of immorality. The biblical call to holiness is an invitation to sync our private life with our public life. You know, often children tell us, Dad, you're just a, you're, you're an hypocrite. You tell me to behave this way, but this is what you do. You tell me that this is what I must be like, but you're not like it. You're an hypocrite. This walk with God requires that we sink every day our private life with our public life, our belief, our integrity, that which we tell the Lord we do or want to do. We need to exercise it every day. When we follow Peter's counsel and live with nothing to hide, we cultivate a deep down healthy sense of our self-worth. Thus, live with nothing to hide. You and I have been set apart for God. And if we have been set apart for God, let it be a genuine walk and walk with nothing to hide. The second principle is to live with nothing to prove. Live with nothing to prove. Peter tells us to live with nothing to prove. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17, the apostle tells us, and if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. Now, what does that mean? Let's go to what the New International Version says. That statement, the New Inter International Version, translates as, as, fol as, as follows. Live your lives as strangers in reverent fear. So we've got to be truthful 
to the beliefs that we have embraced. The Apostle Peter is saying to you and to me, profess Christians and believers, that this world is a temporary residence, for our true home is with God and Christ in the new earth. And you and I should begin to live that way on earth today. Therefore, as we have just read in verse 17, we are urged to live or to live reverently, knowing that our daily conduct reflects our attitude towards God. We are to stand firm when Christian principles are threatened all the time, not only sometimes. It is easy sometimes to look at a person that lives with you, a sister, a brother, a father, a son, and say, well, I just love it. I just love my, my family. And sometimes those principles, those crystal, Christian principles that you so much believe in and treasure are not applied as often as they should apply. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, 1, 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, the apostle tells us that we need to live reverently because, because, verses 18, we know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. Verses 19, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. In verse 18, Peter describes the way of the world as an aimless conduct, or as the New International, International Version uh, describes it, as an empty way of life. You see, you and I, we know you and, you and I can drive a very nice car, be living in a very nice home. You and I can excel in the workplace and have a real portfolio of gold and silver with all the trappings of the good life in inverted commas. And yet, we may still have a miserable experience. The Bible says that our value, your value and my value, is not based on our money. It's not based on our fame. It's not based on our degree. It is even not based on the Andy Cup at, at the country club. It's just not based on any of that. But as Peter describes it in verses 19, our value is based on the blood of Jesus Christ. Your worth, my worth, comes from what Jesus paid to redeem you and I. When you think about it, this is really a very logical argument that Peter makes. After all, how do we determine the value of anything? How do you determine the value of anything, home, a vehicle, uh, anything? The value of anything is determined by what someone will pay for it. That's the true value of any commodity or service. Peter reminds us in verse 19 that our value, our value is based on what God was willing to pay in order to redeem you and I. That is our value. You and I are worth the life of God himself, the precious blood of Christ purchased you for heaven, purchased me for heaven. We are alive because of the life-saving sacrifice of our Creator. Peter goes on to say in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, he indeed, and he's referring to Christ, he indeed was foreordained. Foreordained. Before this world was ever made, he was foreordained 
before men and women were ever made. Christ was foreordained, foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. He appeared for you and for me. He came for you and for me. Verse 21, who through him believed in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory. God who raised Christ from the dead and gave him the glory, glory, so that your faith and my faith, your hope and my hope may remain steadfast in God. Ellen G. White, in manuscript 153, written in 1898, tells us, in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Oh, these are powerful words. What Jesus went through, so did the Father, and so did the Holy Spirit. She says, human beings need to understand that deity suffered and sunk under the agonies of Calvary. Yet Jesus Christ, whom God gave for the ransom of the world, purchased the church with his own blood. Who's the church? We are. You and I are the church. So who purchased the church with his own blood? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ did. We are free to live with nothing to prove. See, when this truth sinks in, when you and I realize what Christ has done for you and why he has done it for you and what he is expecting of you right now, we become empowered to live the self-controlled life because we don't have to feel insecure about our possessions. We don't have to feel insecure about our performance. We don't have to feel insecure about what we look like. We don't have to feel insecure about our position in the marketplace. We are free to live with nothing to prove. We are, live, we are free to live in nothing to, to prove because I no longer live but Christ lives in me. My, my, my desires, my inward desires not only matter because the only desires that matter are those that God places in my heart. Well, there is another principle, a third principle. This principle, principle tells us to live with nothing to gain. Well, let's recap. Live with nothing to hide. Live with nothing to prove. Live with nothing to gain. Peter's final principle for a self-controlled life is to live with nothing to gain. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, uh, we read, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit of insincere love of the brethren. Okay? Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit, insincere love of your brethren, love one another fervently with pure heart. That's almost like a commandment. I will read that in a minute. Verse 23. Having been born again... And you and I were born again. When the Lord touched our hearts, we were born again. Not of corruptible seed, but the incorruptible seed. The seed that was provided through Jesus Christ as we were born again. Through the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. See, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, Christians purify their souls as they obey the truth, the Word of God. You see, the Word of God, the truth, is the channel through which the Lord manifests His Spirit and His power. So obedience to the Word of God produces fruit 
of the required quality. And that's part of what you and I should be producing daily, a genuine and sincere love for the brethren. This love is heaven-born and leads to high motives and to unselfish action. When truth becomes an abiding principle in your life and in my life, the soul is born again, as we read in verse 23. Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed, through the word of God which lives and abides forever. This new birth is the result of receiving Christ as the word of God. Peter's final principle for, self, for a self-controlled life is to live with nothing to gain. So what is Peter really telling in those particular verses, 22 and 23? Love unconditionally. Oh, Victor, that is, that is difficult. Love unconditionally. What is he saying? Unconditionally from the heart, not from the mind, from the heart. Yes, the mind is part of it, but love unconditionally. What is he saying? He's saying, live with nothing to gain. Recklessly, Victor, recklessly pour your life in serving others. This requires intentionality and self-control. But it is in living this way that we begin to experience life on earth as it is in heaven. Our Lord and Savior tells us in John chapter 15, verses 12. I told you I was going to make a reference to this commandment. This is my command. So what's Christ's commandment for you and for me? That you love one another as I have loved you. To love is the greatest commandment there is. So, in 1 Peter 1.12, and we did not read that, the verse before we begun, the apostle tells us, this is the word that, that was preached to you. Today, this is the word that was preached to you. Be self-controlled. Enjoy living in God's kingdom today. And yes, how? Live with nothing to hide. You and I have been set apart for God. Live with nothing to prove. You and I are worth the life of God himself, paid at Calvary for your and my salvation. Live with nothing to gain. Love unconditionally from the heart. Recklessly pour out your life in serving others. May God bless you.